So in this lecture, I'd like to wrap up our series of lectures on the assumptions of linearity and talk about th that final assumption of linear, linear models, which is this assumption of linearity itself. Uh, and pointing out, just as a reminder, that when we talk about linear models, we talk about models that are linear with respect to parameters. So uh, models like polynomials are linear models because you know, with respect to the uh, parameters, it's a linear combination of terms. Uh, that said, there's absolutely nothing sacred about using linear models. And back in lecture six, we went over a, a number of different nonlinear models. And we've actually uh, used nonlinear models a number of times in the course so far. So when we think about uh, how we construct models, uh, you know, if we could consider any arbitrary function or process model, let's say it's G, you know, G predicts Y as a function of X given some parameters theta. Uh, we need to choose that process model. Uh, we need to choose an appropriate data model that may or may not be um, normal. And uh, that data model itself may have additional parameters. And then if we are uh, doing this in a Bayesian perspective, we would need to have priors on the, the theta m, the process model's parameters, and theta d, the data model's parameters. When it comes to fitting nonlinear models, we're going to rarely have an analytical solution to these models. We're going to very, very often uh, have to solve them through num numerical methods, which are the methods we focused on uh, throughout the course anyway. So if we're doing maximum likelihood, that means we're going to resort to uh, numerical optimization and then combining that with something like uh, a likelihood profile or likelihood ratio test, or a bootstrapping to estimate errors uh, and to make predictions. And then in a Bayesian context, we're gonna rely on, on uh, MCMC methods such as Metropolis Hastings. So in a general sense, fitting nonlinear models uh, is nothing that we haven't seen before, nothing that we haven't done before. And again, uh, there's really nothing sacred about the assumption of linear models. Uh, but there are a number of things that we want to watch for when we start working with nonlinear models. Things that exist anyway become, can become more challenging uh, as we have uh, nonlinear models. And one thing that, that often happens is in nonlinear models, parameter identifiability can be uh, more challenging. Um, you know, where we have uh, an inability to, to actually discern uh, and identify what the values of specific parameters are, um, often because there are different parameters that are trading off with each other. Uh, so a, a kind of a simple but uh, a tr trivial but uh, uh, example would be this, this graph here where we might have some parameter process model for mu. Uh, and under the hood, mu involves some combination of mu1 and mu2. And here we're seeing that uh, even though that our estimates of mu itself uh, may be well constrained, our ability to partition that into, say, this mu1 and mu2 terms uh, is not identifiable. These chains are not converging, nor will they converge, because um, there's not, a, you know, if all we're observing is some y that we used to estimate some mu, we can't actually separate mu1 and mu2. There's an infinite number of uh, possible solutions that trade off between these two that are equally valid, and we can't actually separate those. I, this other example here, uh, you know, y equals a over b plus cx uh, is also another example of a model that would have uh, identifiability parameter problems uh, because really in this case we have redundant parameters uh, and, and one of the things we can often do with nonlinear models is to pay close attention uh, to the need for, for possibly re-parameterizing models so you know we, if we had this model with three parameters we could write down an equivalent model uh, that defines you know beta prime and c prime in terms of a b and c and realize that this model would give us the exact same predictions with uh, one less parameter. Uh, this sort of redundant parameter problem uh, can be particularly uh, common when we're dealing with uh, process models 
where we might have parameters that are interacting with each other because the, the way that a process model was originally formulated, there might be uh, you know, uh, biological meaning uh, or physical meaning to these separate parameters, even though they're not actually separable uh, from the data's perspective. Um, or the other thing that can happen is we can have a model that has multiple processes in it, and you know you might have you know equation like this in one part and an equation like that in the other part, and and then suddenly they're being you know multiplied together in some other step, and you know then you end up with you know, you know, a, you know, constant out in front of one and a constant out in front of the other. When you multiply them together, you have two constants that are multiplied by each other and you, you get an unidentifiable situation. Um, and it's not obvious when you're looking at individual equations where individual equations may look identifiable, but the overall uh, process model that involves multiple processes uh, might uh, generate redundancies. Uh, so things that watch out for, uh, the, the lack of uh, convergence, like we saw in the last graph, is one thing to watch out for. Uh, odd correlations between parameters, you know, if parameters at some point are being, you know, multiplied by each other, divided by each other, added by each other, then they're going to end up with uh, not just, you know, uh, kind of the traditional covariance structure like we might see in a slope and intercept in a linear model where those two are correlated with each other. Uh, but they're not strictly, you know, trading off the way where, in this case, where to make one bigger, you have to make the other smaller, and they're literally trading off in, in weird ways. 